Hello, everybody. Uh, welcome to the Marine Biologist Deep Dive, second episode. <laughs> Um, so the Marine Biologist Deep Dive is uh, a, a re relatively new initiative of uh, the Marine Biological Association, aiming to build on um, content published on our lovely science magazine, The Marine Biologist, and we, we choose a, 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 an article to, to focus on. Uh, before we dive into our topic today, I would like to thank everybody who's who's joining us um, across our membership and across the, the, the NBA community. Um, and just a little bit of housekeeping um, before we start. Um, so we'll be together to get today approximately for, uh, for 45 to 60, 60 minutes. Let's see how the conversation goes. Uh, and uh, we, we record in this session, um, so if you want to keep your anonymous and, and stay anonymous, please keep your video off. Uh, and there's, um, you can use the chat function to uh, submit questions to our guest, uh, either uh, by submitting it to everybody or directly to Guy Baker, who's uh, behind the scenes moderating the chat and will be moderating the Q&A at the end. Um, the team also extends to Alex, who's dealing with all the technicalities. Thank you, Alex and John, for being behind the scenes. Um, so please do send your questions throughout as they pop into your mind. Um, a big thanks next goes to Emily Hardesty, um, who uh, is a, an author of an article in the recently published um, issue of the Marine Biologist magazine. Uh, published last month. I'm hoping you all had the opportunity to um, to have a read, uh, especially read Emily's article, which was entitled, which is entitled "Tardigrades and the Origins of Life." Um, Emily, thank you very much for coming. Emily is a, a recent <laughs> a recent uh, marine biology and zoology graduate and is about to embark um, on her master's by research studies at Plymouth University. Um, and it is a great pleasure to, to uh, welcome you to, to this episode, Emily, um, because I think you are up to great things and, um, and I, it's my pleasure to, to share, uh, or, or, and I hope it's also your pleasure to, to be here with, with us today. Definitely, thank you. Yeah, thank you for joining us. So um, you're, um, you are also a keen ambassador um, for uh, the, um, the Rivers Trust um, and do a lot of science communication uh, activities through uh, your own videos on YouTube and write, uh, science writing, etc. So um, that is why I thought uh, it, it, we agreed between you and I, isn't it, that we would do a little bit of both in this session. We'll be talking about the beautiful, weird and wonderful tardigrades, but we will also be talking about a little bit about sci your experience in science, reader writing and communication. Yes. Yeah. Um, okay, so should we um, move on then on to, the, to that other chat. So um, the, I was just wondering, so your article, uh, you are you a recent graduate, um, so you, you agree with me that we, you wouldn't consider yourself a tardigrade expert just yet, but you are, what do you know, what, what do you know about tardigrades from what you, you wrote and you read and you researched? Yeah, um, yes, I am not a tardigrade expert yet, um, but I hope to be one day. <laughs> um, yeah, they are amazing creatures. Um, they're microscopic species, um, they're invertebrates, and they're often um, defined as microscopic animals. Um, they are very complex. They have complete digestive systems and uh, dorsal brains and eye spots, um, and they change in appearance. Uh, um, so you know they have uh, exoskeleton, which is their cuticle, um, and that changes changes in shape um, depending on species, which I always found really interesting. You know, you get some that are really bumpy looking and they look quite armoured 
um, or you get some that are really smooth and they are often nicknamed um, water bears or moss piglets because of what they look like. They, they look like little microscopic bears and they have little claws um, and again the, the number of claws depends on the species and they have little piggy noses as well so they are very interesting looking little creatures um, and of course they are naturally aquatic and they can be found like as I say in the article they can be found in marine and freshwater environments and um, but of course there, there, um, there's also over 100, 1,200 species that have been discovered so far which I just find amazing and they are still finding them now um, and of course they are just they can survive some extreme environments which is what I go on to speak about and that is what really fascinates me about them because like their adaptive abilities that they have so yeah yeah so it's um is, is those fascinating abilities that then kind of like led you to to this article and like how you know what is the link there between um I know that you went through it in in your article but can you remind us what is um the link to the original species and what makes them uh, a potential um an, an enigma uh, in that sense yeah yeah so um they have uh, this amazing adaptation um called anhydrobiosis um and it's defined as a form of uh, cryptobiosis, which basically means it's a physiological life state where, like a dormant life state, um, like a kind of hibernation in a way. Um, and they can uh, uh, release a lot of the water in their body and um, slow their metabolism down to an almost undetectable rate. I think it's like, yeah, it's like 0.01% rate. Um, and they curl up into a ball known as a ton. Um, and they do this when they are exposed to extreme environmental conditions, you know, like extreme temperatures. And then like research has proven that they can survive the vacuum of space um, and ionizing radiation and ultraviolet radiation. It's not all, all tardigrade species that can do this. It's some that can do it. Some are stronger than others. Um, and there are also, like when I was researching for this article, there are other species that have the ability to do anhydrobiosis as well, um, like brine shrimp and um, nematodes. Some of them can do this. But what is unique about tardigrade anhydrobiosis is recently discovered, which was in um, 2019, when they started to look into the cellular functioning of this ability. Um, they found a protein that is unique to the tardigrades and it's called the uh, damage suppressor protein and it's nicknamed the DSUP protein. And they were able to find out that what, like if like you, the tardigrades, like or animals exposed to ionizing radiation, it causes, um, you know, your molecules to like split up um, and break down. Um, but what this, the tardigrades, what this DSUP protein does is it, it binds to their genetic material and stops the protein, the, the DNA, sorry, actually collapsing and breaking down from the radiation. And that is only unique to tardigrades. So it's, it's, it was really fascinating. So because of things like this and the recent discovery, well, not recent discovery, they discovered back in 2007 that they could survive space. Um, that they started to link, scientists have started to question um, whether this ability could link to uh, one of the origin of life theories, which is called pans, this panspermia theory. Um, and that is the theory that um, life um, is distributed throughout the universe um, on meteoroids or space dust and can be spread throughout the universe. Um, and the ability that organisms like tardigrades have could give them the ability to potentially 
make a cosmic distance. Um, you know, so that's why it links to the panspermia because it's a, an adaptation that makes an organism survive space. So then they started to question whether the panspermia theory could be correct and whether there could be a potential link. And it's um, not much so that tardigrades themselves hold the link. It's, it's more of the adaptation itself could. This because, person. you know, like, yeah, yeah. Because, you know, like tardigrades, they date back, uh, the fossil records of them date back 500 million years, but the first life started to evolve 3.7 uh, seven billion years ago. So it's it's more of the fact that this adaptation somewhere down the line, the adaptation of anhydrobiosis, could hold a link to the origin of life. Adaptations like that, and that's why it could link to the panspermia theory. Yeah. yeah. So, as, to your knowledge, this uh, uh, damage suppressor protein found in in tardigrades is not found in other species? As far as I know, yes. When I was researching for this article, it it said that like a lot of scientists have said, and as, as they're researching it, because you know it's only so so recently discovered, um, they have been saying that this is a protein unique to tardigrades, and it, it, it helped them understand a bit more as to how they can actually undertake this process and survive these conditions. Um, and is not the, I'm, I'm going to attempt to say that word, the ane, where was it? Anhydrobasis. Anhydrobasis, yeah. <laughs> so that alone wouldn't um, make tardigrades a, a, a potential candidate for explaining the original of, origins of life. Because like you said, other species have this ability as well. It's, yeah. It's this combination of... Yeah. Um, these two characteristics um, yeah and what 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 do you think do you think um this this of this um you know hypothesis do you think do you believe it or do you do you want to dig further yeah um so you know this like their anhydrobiotic state that they can go into seems to be very complex and a lot of it is still very like it's not understood there's still a lot to discover about it you know but obviously it's it, it, it does seem to be that it could give them the ability or go to make a cosmic distance but when it comes to the pan panspermia theory um i mean that theory has been spoken about and discussed for centuries you know it's always popped up throughout science and a, a lot of scientists have spent their lifetimes dedicating research towards it and what I think like I definitely think it's highly probable that it could be how potentially how the first life could have originated or got here like if, if it was the panspermia theory it would be that life actually came here from space and what makes me think it's more probable is because research into the panspermia theory has proven that space dust is largely organic so it they actually have proven that it contains carbon and you know carbon is like the backbone um to life um so things like that make it high, i think quite highly probable that an organism somewhere way back down the line could have been able to make a cosmic distance using an ability like what tardigrades have, the anhydrobiosis. And yeah, and seeing as there is carbon in, in the space dust, I think those two links. So I, I do think it's highly probable, definitely. Um, but then, yeah, I'm fascinated in other origins of life theories as well, like, like my last article was about deep sea hydrothermal vents and i've always been fascinated with deep sea habitats and there Can you is remind us what what did you cover in that article for those uh, yeah. perhaps newer members who didn't read it 
Yeah, so that one was, um, it was titled A Once Untouched World Now Under Threat. Um, and it's basically about the potential impacts of deep sea mining um, on hydrothermal vent deep sea ecosystems. Um, so hydrothermal vents are, you know, they can be found 1,000 to 4,000 meters down in the ocean, um, usually along mid-Atlantic ridges, along the mid-Atlantic ridge, um, and um, they are they can be described as uh, fissures or hot springs that uh, pump out chemical laden fluids into the ocean. Um, and I start in the article. I I, I covered um, how the species survive down in these harsh conditions. These vents are hosting a variety of life. So I was talking about how the species have adapted. So they use um, a process called chemosynthesis, which unlike photosynthesis, um, you know, it doesn't require sunlight. Um, it's all about the bacteria that are down at the vents that extract um, energy from the chemicals and minerals pumped out from the vents and use that to turn, to turn it into energy. So I was discussing how there's this, this life down there that has evolved in such a complex way um, and it is, it's thriving. Um, and obviously with um, demand for minerals and metals is rising, which means the demand for deep sea mining has obviously increased as we're running out of resources on land. And these vents, um, areas around these vents have high concentrations of zinc and copper and lead and, and barium and stuff. So um, mining operations uh, it, the vents are at risk of the mining operations coming down to base potentially destroy these habitats for these mineral resources and what they then started to touch on is that research is suggesting that these hydrothermal vent ecosystems are quite dependent on each other so these vents can be separated by hundreds of kilometers. Um, so, and there, there's research that suggests that each vent relies on larval transfer from one vent to another to keep on thriving. Right. So, if a mining operation comes down and potentially destroys one vent habitat, then that could be a domino effect potentially for the rest of the vent habitats. Mm -hmm. And then also, there's the fact that there's still a lot of species undiscovered in the deep sea, you know, so mining operations could potentially remove species that we may never have known. Um, yeah. and, and, the, and the processes, isn't it, that, um, yeah. that you say that chemo, chemo synthesis, um, with your fascination for the origins of life, probably is this, you know, if we don't look into this before they are destroyed, it could be a real shame. Exactly, exactly. Yeah, um, um, yeah, thank you for, for reminding us of your, your previous article. And uh, I'm not, I'm, I'm, I hope, uh, and I, I wouldn't be surprised if the audience shares with me, um, is your, uh, you know, your fascination for, for these, so it's very evident, they're very, very passionate <laughs> about these subjects. And, um, and they are kind of related, but actually not that related. Um, yeah, and yeah. you know you 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 are very um, articulate in speaking about these these subjects. You obviously have done lots of research. So I was just wondering if you wanted to share with us how how do you go about uh, you know deciding to write articles like this and um, and how do you go about doing it? Where does the motivation inspiration come from? And um, and do you have any any tips? Yeah, yeah, definitely. Um, so, yeah, um, obviously, I'm very um, interested in anything to do with origins of life, um, species adaptations, especially extreme adaptations like the alkydribiosis and also the species of hydrothermal vents. 
Um, so anything like that has just always fascinated me so much. Any also unanswered questions, it just intrigues me so much that I just want to research into it as much as I can. And that just gives me the motivation to want to write about it. Um, because alongside my research, I love communicating and talking about science and, you know, different species. So writing scientific, like an article, is a great way to do that. It combines two of my interests. Um, so, and the tips, like what, what I usually start off doing is I, um, I, I read a lot of scientific papers um, and I can actually access a lot of them uh, through Google Scholar. I found there's quite a lot out there that you can get enough of your information from, you know. Um, I read books as well uh, for the tardigrade article I got this book um, from, um, it was from my university library and it was on the origin, um, it was um, biology of uh, water bears it was called, so you know that's what they're nicknamed, so. um, yeah. and I just was like reading about them, but then also um, I contacted professionals within the fields of the research I was looking into, you know, so for the, for the deep sea article I contacted um, Richard Lutt, um, who is, a, he, he does a lot of deep sea research and a lot of deep sea study. And that's also how I got um, the pictures. He sent me some pictures for the research, asked recent, for that article. And then for the Tardigrade article, I also contacted a Tardigrade doctor in America um, called Dr. Miller. And um, so, yeah, like when, when I'm starting off with writing these articles, it's all, it's all about doing the scientific research and then if I have any questions, you know, things that I'm not too sure on or anything like that, I've always had positive results from contacting professionals in the in the field, you know, and then if they, they can, if it, I always think if they can see your your interest and your passion in the subject, most of the time you, you they're going to reply. Um, and, you know, and if I have, if I'm unsure on anything, I'll always check. Um, with them as well and then what I also do is I try and just immerse myself in the subject as much as possible so for the tardigrade article I wanted to just get myself into tardigrade world as much as I could so I, I went out and I collected my own samples I collected moss samples because a lot of tardigrades are found in like terrestrial tardigrades are found in very moist habitat so they a lot of you can find them in moss so I collected those moss samples and I collected some marine sediment um, and just found the tardigrades under the microscope um, at my uni and then tried to ID them as much as I could because they're quite difficult to ID because there's so many different ones <laughs> and I mean, a lot of when you ID. To help you. Yeah, like yeah, exactly. Um, and because they're not like, they're, they are microscopic, but um, it, they, you don't really need a really strong um, microscope to see them you know okay. so you, you can see them on just like stand microscopes at home ones you know if you've got one at home or anything like that so yeah I just tried to just get myself in tardigrade world and just analyze them and alongside doing all the research and then yeah that's that's what I would say like some of my tips on writing so how long did the, that process does a process like that take you because um in between you thinking of the article and researching it and you know you I'm guessing you go with specific questions to the experts when you 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 don't just say oh I'm writing an article right you no, ask yeah. specific questions so like and how long does that whole process take probably quite a long time no yeah it is um so I would say quite a few months it, it, it depends how much research I'm doing and, and how much I'm, if I'm talking about like a really complicated subject, like I, I would say the tardigrade and hydrobiosis is quite a complicated subject, you know, because yeah. like looking into the processes of it, the cellular functioning was, is really complex and obviously a lot of it is unknown still. So, um, yeah, it did take me about like two, about roughly two months um, to do, get all the research behind me and yeah I, I do ask the if I am unsure I ask the professionals like specific questions because I was um, quite unsure about um, 
the um, there was there's the classes of tardigrades, like the taxonomic classes, because it changes all the time um, when they when they discover a new species. You know, so I I was asking him about that just to make sure I had that correct. That there's mm -hmm. three taxonomic classes so far. You know, but yeah. So. Yeah, because that um, kind of uh, links with the fact that. Um, you know, we're talking about um, popular science writing and science writing in general, so not really referring to uh, peer-reviewed articles, which are the ones that got, get published in. So those, those articles, you're talking about those scientific articles, but that doesn't mean, uh, you know, it, by using the, 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 the magazine and the science, the popular science writing, um, as a way of communicating, you still need to make sure it's it's correct and um, yeah, yeah, definitely, isn't it? Yeah. Um, yeah, because then we don't want to misinform people who who we're trying to reach with these with these articles, isn't it? Um, yeah, I was. I think you kind of uh, have it. Um, I think it's very evident, at least for for me, because obviously we spoke a couple of times or three times uh, now, but. Um, so, so after after your your masters or, or as part of your masters, so into the future, what? How does this all link up? Is is this the kind of research that you see yourself doing in the future? Do you want to further explore this? How does this all link up with where you where you aiming to go? Um, yes. Yeah, so I, the aim is to be a a research scientist looking into subjects like this. So missing links in species origins and extreme species adaptations. So the ideal would be that I could, I would love to look more into how um, the tardigrade and hydrobiosis works. I'd love to do more research into that to get more of an understanding of how the process works. And then that could even, you know, if you research into adaptations like this could open up a whole world of answers and more links to of the origins of of species, you know, because these adaptations have to come from somewhere, um, and obviously through evolution, you know, the, if species are exposed to different things, then they evolve different adaptations. So adaptations like this are just that's why I find them so fascinating. So I'd love to look more into that, and then especially on the deep sea side of things as well, I'd love to research the hydrothermal vent species and the habitats around that, um, and I would in particular I'd love to look at the the it's called the vents of the lost city and they're the white um vents um, and they're discovered in the year 2000 and I'd love to research them because they're pumping out hydrocarbons as well which is another thing so you've got this origin of life theory in space from pan the panspermia and then you've got the one down at the deep ocean because these vents are also pumping out hydrocarbons the compounds for life so both of them I would just love to look at both of them, the space and the deep sea one. Um, and then also... The practical coming. Yeah, 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 that would be a great idea. I'd love to do that. Um, and yeah, so just, and also like writing the articles themselves is, it, it, is my, it's my other love, you know, because it's communicate, like science communication and, and presenting like what research has found. Um, what is what is known so far, the unanswered questions to the public. I love doing that. So aside from all my research um, science aspirations and the career I'm going for, I also love doing presenting. I'm, I'm also an aspiring wildlife presenter, and that's why I'm doing this with the Rivers Trust as well. I, I, I do presenting with them. I talk about the importance of river habitats and freshwater ecosystems, and I do that to the public. And we make little documentaries and things like that. And then I've started my own YouTube channel where I make wildlife documentaries and things. So it's both of these things combined, you know, the research side and talking about it. So that's why writing articles like this and researching subjects like this really fit into what I want to do, definitely. So, yeah. Amazing. I'm um, I'm glad there is a marine biologist magazine out there for you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and there's an Emily for the marine biologist magazine. Um, <laughs> so I wonder if if you would be okay to maybe now uh, just to see maybe hand over to to Guy and see whether there's any questions coming in. 
and yeah. from from the audience and maybe continue the chat a little bit like that would you be okay with that yeah yeah that's okay. fine thank you okay guy are you there hello can you see and hear me hi yeah, yeah. yeah. Hi Emily. Hi. Hi. Hiya. <laughs> Good to see you. Um, you too. Really, uh, you're really interesting, and um, you're obviously so enthusiastic and motivated. It's brilliant. Um, Thank you. A couple of questions. Um, one from John. Um, he said he's heard that uh, tardy grades survive in space, and he says, "Do you know when when that was?" I and mean, I think he says, "Was it on the International Space Station?" Do you know? Was it on a, where was the experiment done? I think is the question. And so it was in 2007, I believe, the first one they did. And they sent them up in a satellite um, and they, they did, a, it, it was on a particular couple of different tardigrade species. Um, and they had different, three different uh, projects that they were doing. They, they first just tested the tardigrades, how they were in the not out in space, so just actually in the satellite, and then they tested the species, some of them in the dormant life state of anhydrobiosis, and some of them out of it, so active. Um, the ones that were active, they didn't make it. It was the were a lot of the ones that were in this survival state that made it. Still, a few of them didn't. It did go down to species, you know, like they are some species are stronger um, than others in this way of um, surviving. And even some of them had even laid eggs while they were exposed to the vacuum of space, which is insane. So, yeah, that's when <laughs> they did that. So it was, yeah, way back in 2007. And then they tried to do another one, um, I believe, in 2011. Um, but it didn't go well. I think uh, something crashed or something. Uh, yeah, but I, I know that I, I, I've heard that they're recent. They're trying to do it again. I think they're sending them to the moon or they've got some on the moon now, um, which they're going to retest again once they've left them there for a while. Because, yeah, but so, as soon as they're in this dormant life state, they can survive for centuries. Um, you know, the average lifespan of a tardigrade when it's not in this life state is is two to four months to own to two years but as soon as they're in this life state they they've been known to survive it's like decades um so yeah i think that's what they're doing and that's when they did the last one you know 2007. Um, we've done some quite nasty things to tidy grades haven't we and yes uh, <laughs> yeah <laughs> yeah um, and they I think they have done it with um, nematodes as well. Like I said before, like the uh, nematodes can do it. And I, so I think they have tested other species, but it's it's not been as um, successful as with the tardigrades. Um, so yeah. It, it makes you reflect on how um, persistent life is. And, and um, yeah. somewhere that uh, when there have been catastrophic events in Earth's history, like meteor strikes and things, that um, deep sea tardigrades, for example, have, uh, uh, pretty much unaffected they carry on yeah. as before mm. yeah it is amazing uh, there was even one scientist that claimed and we don't know if it's true but um it was way back in the 19th century and she claimed that um she was a zoologist and she she got a moss sample that was 120 years old uh, it was a dried moss sample from a museum and she put it in water and she claimed that one of the tardigrades started to wake up again but there's not like official evidence for that but recent research has proven you know after like 10 years and even after 30 years they have been woken up again um which is crazy so yeah it does yeah as you said how resilient life is <laughs> um i have a, a question here from um bike who asks with events releasing hydrocarbons could it mean mm. that if for some reason life on the planet ended, could it restart from there? You know, that's, that's a really good question. Um, I mean, potentially, if if the hydrothermal vent origin of life theory was proven, then, then definitely, I, I think. so. Because the theory behind the, the, the hydrocarbons being pumped out of the white vents 
um, they are the, these vents are alkali they're called alkaline vents because they're pumping out, out more alkaline outputs into the ocean um, whereas you've got black vents that pump out acidic um, chemicals but the idea behind the white vents is that way back all millions of years ago the ocean was very acidic you know because you had the the ocean had just been formed and very acidic so these white vents were pumping out alkaline outputs into the ocean and, and these hydrocarbons which potentially could have given um the ability for these for protobions they're called uh, so they're like a group of uh, the chemicals could have grouped together like clump like clumped together and, and formed an early membrane using the energy from the vent to survive and then eventually be released out into the ocean and form the first rna and then dna so if yeah like if it was all to go wrong and it, it could if these vents continue to survive and they don't get destroyed by deep sea mining or anything like that you know then it could start again i i, I think you know there's there is definitely a possibility i mean they're pumping out hydrocarbons they are the compounds for life so potentially yeah and as you were talking i was just thinking perhaps life is starting all the time and perhaps life yeah has been starting ever since it began throughout life's history and those those yeah. those protobionts are being generated in in whatever um uh environments are suitable and it, it wasn't just it didn't just start once it's probably been starting all through history but we don't notice now because we're swamped in life exactly and and also like there's there's ideas that these vents now they could be in other solar systems and i had like a random like little idea the other day that if they, if these vents could be in solar systems other other solar systems and then you've got you know say they're pumping out hydrocarbons there as well i know that's like a crazy idea but say that's happening and then you've got the idea of the panspermia theory that there's carbon in space stuff. So, you know, it could be that maybe the two are connected somewhere, that you've got these vents in, in different places. And there's carbon in space and there's carbon in the deep sea. And it's all, as you said, constantly re going on and on and on. It could all be connected. So, yeah, it's very interesting. <laughs> um, to move on to another question. <coughs> Excuse me. Nigel Marley asks. Uh, he says a tardigrade sample was present on an Israeli satellite, uh, deliberately crashed onto the moon's surface. What risks do you think this type of experiment might present? Uh, well, bad risks, I would say. I mean, like the, these these experiments, they are, you know. I mean, another reason why they're they're not done often as you know they 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 cost a lot of money and they are risky to do um you know it, and i think that i think the one that other one i mentioned where it crashed that might have been the one that he's just mentioned um yes and you, i mean you don't really know i i mean it's not great that it's crashing on um to the moon and things like that so yeah mm. Yeah, it's just hard to answer. Yeah, it is risky, I suppose. And I guess it's the the, the danger of um, um, taking evolved life onto a, a yeah a planet or a satellite that might have very early form of life of its own that could be exactly exactly. You know, so it's it's interfering, um, and I know you know that then and, and that obviously has been proven a lot in history interfering with nature hasn't gone very well at all um so yeah that could be but there's even ideas like there's a lot of it it's not i mean a lot of scientists don't agree with this but then some people think this as well but that these tardigrades because it's really hard to find where they fit in um the tree of life um they it's said that they um, may have evolved from early eukaryotic cells uh, and, and um, even links to annelids, but then it's really unknown where they actually connect in the tree, on, in the tree of life, which I find really interesting um, as well, 
uh, and as some people have even suggested that they could have made a cosmic distance themselves and come here from somewhere else because they just don't seem to connect with anything much um, so yeah like as you said like doing that with like with the with the, with the crashing and then they are, they could be potentially releasing tardigrades and you know other species onto another planet that and these species could survive and obviously you know if there is other life there then that could take over so yeah it's there's a lot of risks that could come about from doing this kind of research definitely fascinating um there's another question here from matt um he says tardigrades are seen as fairly indestructible and are not often considered from the conservation point of view you imply in your article that we should be more concerned particularly for deep sea communities are there any other threats to other communities or species of tardigrades? i'm sorry just cut out a little bit then my connection sure. could you just repeat that i'm sorry <laughs> and I'll, I'll read it again <laughs> thank Tardigrades. you um, tardigrades are seen as fairly indestructible and not often considered from a conservation point of view. Yeah. You, you imply in your article that we should be more concerned, particularly for deep sea communities. Are there any other threats to other communities or species of tardigrades? Um, I mean, because there's still so much unknown about them and the species are continuously being discovered, it's hard to say. I mean, they 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 are quite indestructible, but yeah, some tardigrade species aren't as strong as others, you know. Um, and I, it's not really known how how many there are of some taxonomic some taxonomic tardigrade classes than others. I mean, I I know that there's a lot of the the U tardigrade class get found a lot of species within that. They're mainly the ones that are found on um, terrestrial moist habitats. You know, and the Hepstar degrader, they're the ones that are a lot stronger um, and they seem to be surviving space exposure more. So, yeah, I, I, but, you know, I suppose if there, there was to continue doing these experiments, then it could be a risk to them. Um, but again, it's it's unknown because there's just they're, they're so adaptive and there's so many of them and there's so many more to be discovered. So, yeah. So we're yes. putting you on this, I think you're being put on the spot here a bit, Emily. As a, <laughs> it's okay. Not a great expert. But, um, <laughs> so, uh, they were all the questions we have. I, I think we should probably keep speaking and just see if there are any more questions come through. Um, yeah. Anne, have you got anything, um, anything to add? Uh, no, I think we probably can, um, um, if there's no more questions coming um, from from the audience, there were some really, really good questions and uh, you, you, you rose well up to the challenge, Emily, well done. <laughs> Thank um, you. So uh, I guess we, we could uh, start wrapping up if that's okay with everybody. Uh, once again, thank um, Emily very, very, very much, um, not only for, for the article and your time here for the episode of the, the Marine uh, Biologist's Deep Dive, but also for your you know, infectious enthusiasm and commitment to marine biology. Uh, you know, uh, uh, the community should, should watch out for you, you're coming. <laughs> <laughs> so good luck you. on your on your onward journey, um, and I would like to thank um, everybody who's attended as well, and who who enjoys the magazine and enjoys these deep dives. And please tell others. Um, and uh, you know, we now have uh, four opportunities a year to to have these sessions with the, with the magazine now being published four times a year. And um, the, the the voice of the marine biology is is stronger. The more people are behind it, the more of us are behind it. So uh, you know, do get um, let's all get behind and perhaps even join them uh, if if possible. Uh, this, um, as you probably know, we've had um, we've been running a series of marine biology lives as well as the deep uh, deep dives, 
Uh, and the next uh, session, we will welcome Sonia Batten um, to the Marine Biology Live session on the 3rd uh, of September. Uh, note the time, it's an afternoon slot rather than a morning slot, but members in, uh, will be notified if you, if you are on our mailing list, obviously you'll be notified. And she will be talking, uh, her title of the talk is East Meets West, Dynamic Biogeography. I couldn't read that, sorry. Um, so once again, thank you very much um, and see you at the next deep dive.